Okay. A very good afternoon to one and all of you. We shall look forward to going into preferred practice guidelines in some topics associated with retina. We have some very prolific experts in the panel. We have with us our very eminent Dr. Atul Kumar, heading All India Institute, Dr. Lalit Parma, our president, elect AIOS, Dr. Shobhi Chavla, who is a chairman and MD of Prakash Kendra, Lucknow, Dr. Avinash Patanjay, director of Academy of Education, LVPI, and consultant, Vitro Retina and UVA Services. I hope Dr. Subhadra Jalali has joined us. She is a director, Retina Institute, Newborn Eye Health Reliance and Direct Aid Quality, Dr. Shaira Shroff, medical director of Shroff Eye Center, and Dr. Jyotir Mehbishwas, director of the UVA department, Shankar Netralia, Chennai. And I have co-moderating with me the International Hero Awardee, Dr. Srinivas Joshi, who's also member ARC South, leading the Vitrio Retina and UVA department of the MM Joshi Eye Institute. We shall start the session with our first speaker. Most importantly, all of us have to stick to our six minutes without fail. They'll buzz the life out of us. And then we can could take some questions uh, so that there is more information transfer. Our first speaker in this session is Dr. Tenarsan, who's a senior consultant with Retina Eye Foundation, Coimbatore, who shall be talking on the essentials, ultrasound in ophthalmology for posterior segment evaluation. On to you. Good evening, everyone. And I'm thankful to AOS and ARC and Chitramam for giving me this wonderful opportunity. So I'll be discussing about essentials of B-scan in posterior segment evaluation. So coming to uh, the principle, uh, the electric energy is converted into sound energy, sound energy in the piezoelectric crystals and the sound energy is reflected in the intraocular structures and the reflected waves are captured in the probe and it is converted in the, into the images in the monitor. The frequency of wave is inversely proportional to its wavelength, whereas wavelength is directly proportional to its penetration. Hence, larger the frequency, lesser is the penetration, and more is the resolution of resultant echographs. So these are the different frequencies used in different ultrasound probes. And we have a time amplitude A scan, brightness B scan, combination of the above. In addition, the modification, we have three-dimensional ultrasound and combination of color Doppler with B scan. So in the probes, we can have three different sections. The transfer section, the, uh, the transducer is, transducer is kept parallel to the limbus and the marker is also kept parallel to the limbus and it helps in detecting the lateral extension of the lesion. Whereas in the longitudinal section, the transducer is kept perpendicular to the limbus and the probe is towards always towards the center of cornea. It helps in detecting the anterior posterior limit of the lesion and the optic disc will always be inferior to the macula in this section. Whereas in the axial, it is measured in the primary case and the probe will be kept in the center of cornea and it helps in detecting the lesion or membrane in relation to the optic nerve. How to define, describe the lesion? In terms of internal reflectivity or echogenicity or in terms of in relation to the location, extension and in dimension, shape and structure in relation to the mobility. So what are the indications of B-scan? Uh, the following media opacity conditions and in the following clear media conditions. So coming to some clinical scenarios, acidular hyalosis commonly we come across. So in ultrasound, it appears as a small, mild to moderate vitreous dot echoes with a clear translucent space behind the vitreous dot echoes under the retina. It is classical of acidular hyalosis. And commonly we, with vitreous hemorrhage, there are different causes of vitreous hemorrhage. It could be proliferative diaptic retinopathy or PVD induced or ocular trauma. So how ultrasound is going to help in the diagnosis and management. So the first picture shows a fresh vitreous hemorrhage with the low to medium moderate vitreous uh, echoes. Whereas the second picture shows the uh, liquefied vitreous with the pseudomembrane formation. So in the ultrasound, we can detect the, whether the vitreous hemorrhage is fresh or it is in the uh, previous vitreous hemorrhage. And in diapertic vitreous hemorrhage, again, we can notice subhyalite hemorrhage. So here we can see there is a moderate to severe vitreous dot echoes behind the vitreous in front of the retina. So classically, it is subhyalite hemorrhage is definitely indicated for surgery. Again, in diapertic vitreous hemorrhage, it is definitely to look for tractions. With underlying hemorrhage, there will be fibrovascular tractions pulling the macula and retina. It is it help, the ultrasound will be helpful in planning the surgery and in explaining the prognosis to the patient. 
and again in the vitreous hemorrhage in the elderly population we should look for any subretinal hemorrhage at the macula because the prognosis and the visual outcome for these patients are very less so in post vitreous vitreotomized high re vitreous hemorrhage that is a re bleed the vitreous uh hemorrhage is very difficult to pick up only if you increase the gain we can see mild to moderate vitreous dot echoes so this is a case of pvd induced vitreous hemorrhage the first picture shows a complete pvd second picture shows incomplete pvd so how to differentiate pvd from rd so in pvd you can see a thin line which disappears if we reduce the gain whereas in retinal detachment if you reduce the gain the reflectivity will still persist and in the retinal detachment the retina will always be attached to the optic disc whereas it might or may not be attached to the uh, optic disc in cases of pvd and there will be classic after movement which will be persist in posterior vitreous detachment where, where it is absent in cases of retinal detachment so again in retinal detachment you can see 100% spike in the a scan in cases of chronic retinal detachment you can see the multiple intraretinal cyst and depending upon the pvr formation it could be open funnel or closed funnel configuration of retinal detachment whereas in diabetic tractional retinal detachment you can see a tent like configuration which is extended mostly in the posterior fold and again the table top configuration will also be seen and again it will be helpful in planning the surgery and uh, whereas in vascular trds it will be restricted to the equator beyond the equators and this is a case of exudative rd and you can see there's a classic uh, shifting fluid the first picture is taken in the lying down position second picture is taken in the uh, sitting position the convexity and the fluid increases and again we have to look for rcs thickness and, and any underlying masses because of the pathology of any inflammatory condition or any mass underlying lesion which causes exudative rd so coming to choroidal detachment how to differentiate from retinal detachment usually choroidal detachment will be restricted uh, towards periphery it will be dome shaped and the mobility will be very minimal and it will be of serious variety or hemorrhagic variety and post surgically in buccal you can see a buccal indent and first picture shows post vitreotomy silicon oil space there is a retro silicon oil space and which helps in uh, detecting underfilled or overfilled eyes and this is a post vitreotomy gas filled eye you can see the shadowing and uh, extensive shadowing behind the meniscus of gas and coming to retinoblastoma there will be a mass lesion which could be exophytic or endophytic with multiple calcification within the lesion and there will be a post acoustic shadowing and concomitant rd might or may not be present and again another cause of leukocoria in children will be a persistent how to differentiate from retinoblastoma it will be a microphthalmos the axial length will be very less and there will be a tor thickened vitreous band adherent to the optic disc It's a classic picture of eval melanoma, where you can see the coral button appearance or mushroom-shaped appearance, and choroidal excavation will also be there. So again, some inflammatory conditions in posterior scleritis. There will be classic T sign, which is mainly due to low, low reflective infiltrate behind the peripapillary sclera, and in addition, there will be increased RCS thickness. It's a classic. Do you have a cold tenor, sir? Yes, ma'am. so vicate syndrome we can see multiple serous detachments in addition there will be rcs thickness and if we increase the gain there will be mild vitreous dot echoes in front of suggestive of inflammation thank you ma'am thank you that was a very detailed talk uh, just one question to one of the guest uh, expert panel uh, dr lalit is there dr atul kumar not there okay last dr abhinash how do you measure axial length in a high myopic cephaloma so oh, axial length uh, hmm. we want to try i have never done that uh, but the issue is uh, axial length the contact lens would be far better than anything else than a non the limiting factor here is of course the regeneration yeah, the potential for regeneration of the outer retinal cells and that is something that we are still waiting to see how much um, uh, could you mute Yes, yes, Doctor uh, Abhinash, could you continue? In some cases, uh, particularly high myopes, where there's a lot Excuse of. Excuse me, I think you have to uh, mute. Someone is attending two meetings at the same. Yeah, two meetings. This is such Atul a. Atul must be attending three, four meetings. <laughs> oh no, there's a gross <laughs> insult to ARC. No, no, we won't. Do <laughs> so where were we? Who was Doctor Abhinash? Doctor Abhinash. Yeah. Hmm. So I, I would prefer the contact lens way of going about with the measurement of uh, axial length, and so 
that would be the preferred modality for me. But I'm, I, have, I have to admit that in all ways by which we have the various new instruments, the IOL masters and all those things, which can give a better uh, way of calculating. Uh, theoretically, I know, but practically, to be honest, I have no experience. Anybody to add? Renarsan, you want to tell something? Yeah, uh, in ultrasound, we can measure, but the only thing, IOL master will have the fixation. Whereas uh, it will help in exactly the it fixate over the fovea. Whereas in ultrasound, uh, we cannot fixate. Depend upon the where the posterior staphyloma is. If the fovea is at the edge of the staphyloma or it's the center of the staphyloma, there will be a variation in, uh, uh, in the measurement of axial length. So a better method will be where the eye fixates. So IOL master will be best. Thank you. So you said the same answer in a different way. Thank you. We shall go on to our next speaker, Dr. Raju Narayan who's the director of network head and clinical research of LVPI, who's going to be telling us how to better interpret OCT in retinal disorders. On to you, doctor. Thank you so much, Dr. Chitra. Um, I'll be talking about OCT interpretation and also not just the OCT by itself. What do you do if you have a particular finding A, B, or C? I would like to thank my co-authors. Uh, we have worked on some of these presentations earlier. And I got some images from some of them. The disclaimer is that uh, OCT terminologies keep changing every few months. ISOS junction then becomes ellipsoid zone. Then you will have newer term, choroidal cleft, uh, drill, so many of them. It is beyond the scope of this presentation. But the basics of OCT interpretation will guide us in better care of our patients. You should be the master of OCT or in fact any diagnostics and not be a servant. In the sense, you should be able to interpret and either approve or reject what the machine is telling us. Our clinical judgment is supreme always. OCT can be used to diagnose, prognosticate, plan treatment or medical treatment or surgery. In terms of ARMD or other causes of CNVM, it is important to know the cause of the CNVM and the type of the CNVM. CNVM is only a sign. It is not a disease by itself. Many diseases can cause choroidal neovascular membrane. We have choroidal osteoma. It's a wide range, high myopia. Obviously, macular degeneration is number one. You can have inflammatory cause. You can have injured so You can have inherited retinal dystrophies as causes of CNVM. But all of them have different prognosis, different response to treatment. What are the types of CNVM based on histopathology or OCT? There are mainly three types. Type one is what you see generally as occult CNVM on FA, which is below the RP. As you can see here, most of the CNVM in this case is below the RP. That has a different prognosis. Type two is generally classic CNVM on FA. Usually it is above the RP. Usually this will have a slightly different prognosis. While you may be giving injections in all of them, but you should know which diseases cause which type. I will come to it in the later slides. And how do they respond to treatment? Some of them like ARMD, you have to give 70, 80, 90, 100 injections also over many years. Whereas myopic CNVM, you will have to give very few injections or choroidal osteoma. The type three is retinal angiomatous proliferation, which is intraretinal. So what are the differences, occult and classic or type one and type two? If you have done an OCT, if it is mostly below the RP, ARMD is the most common. What does happen? So what? Most ARMD CNVMs are type one and they respond very slowly. They take a lot of time and they progress also slowly as I have written at the bottom. What about type two? If it, it is above the RP, um, in general, ARMD, very few of them have a classic component, but main ones are myopic, inflammatory, injured streaks, choroidal elastomer, even parafoil telangiectasia, which can start from intraretinal. They tend to progress fast and resolve also with fewer injections. If a patient asks you, doctor, can I delay my injection by a few days? I'm going for some marriage or wedding, something, some, some excuse they will have. So you have to decide which ARMD, which CNVM are you dealing with and how many injections you can prognosticate. So one next point about OCT is sometimes not every dark reflective space is edema. This is outer retinal tubulation. What you see is they have a lining, hyper reflective lining, uh, which is called outer retinal tubulation and they are not suggestive of edema. You don't have to treat them in general. Obviously, subretinal scar, if you have 
shadowing underneath the thick membrane and clinically also it's a scar don't have to inject these cases but what do you tell the patient patient let's say as armd you have decided to treat what the cat trial shows is that patients you can treat either monthly injection or you can do prn when i mean prn in cat trial it was monthly visit but you don't inject when there is no fluid but the visit is every month the average letter gain is about 8.8 letters if you use uh, lucentis monthly or 7.8 injections if you use avastin monthly so this is something which we all should know it's not about just uh, seeing fluid or giving injection you should be able to tell the patient what is likely to be in your case how much is going to be the gain what is the number of injections you are likely to receive if you see a thumb like pd or sharp pd it may signify pcv other uh, oct diagnostic tools for pcv include a notched pd or a, even a double layer sign which corresponds to the branching vascular network why is this important because pcv is one they can bleed two they may sometimes need treatment other than anti vgf pdt unfortunately is no longer available but ttt or if they have covid polyps then you can give uh, thermal laser in these cases not everything that is subretinal which is hyperreflective should be injected this is a patient who presented after receiving two injections in the left eye he had some subretinal yellowish lesion on oct he had this hyperreflectivity some subretinal fluid and this actually was uh, when we did the fa it was subretinal fibrin and you could see the typical csr leak point point leak and we did navelas laser and with uh, no further injection only laser this result so not everything which is hyper reflective with fluid is cnvm don't keep injecting just because there is something hypo reflective what about dme if you have dme you should also know what to tell the patient other than many injections have to be given or unfortunately most people say only three loading doses as if dme will be over in three months no so in patients who receive injections in dme even at five years the average letter gain was seven to ten letters what did it show when you have different types of injections whether it's uh, bevacizumab ranibizumab or aflibercept i think it's my timer so i'll just uh, go to the next slides fast so you have to decide the baseline visual acuity to decide what is going to be the improvement like in this case if it is erm 2040 good uh, ellipsoid zone you can do a surgery and patient will improve very nicely whereas this patient has edema disrupted ellipsoid zone 2060 vision this patient probably will improve two to three lines and not more than that so what is the end point for uh, injection can i request you to say, please conclude let us give me one or 30 seconds so uh, there are indian dme guidelines anti vegf are recommended as first line uh, laser if it's non central surgery for vmt or erm end point that when can you stop injecting when there is no change in vision for two or more consecutive visits after the first 6 months or less than 50 microns change so vrsa members usually switch after three injections this is uh, i will skip this one here uh don't become an oct specialist be a retina specialist this patient came to me saying that he was told that he was advised injection because of edema when we repeated the scan actually it was macular hole edge of the macular hole has edema so you should look at all the scans so don't be an oct specialist and be a retina specialist a good funder examination is important i have just finished with one last video get trained in whatever even if it is injections get trained uh okay unfortunately it's not playing this was a patient who got uh, ozx injection by retina surgeon unfortunately the injection was given inside the lens patient uh, underwent cataract surgery and the fake and the ozx implant also came out with the fake emulsification so get trained before you treat any patient so in conclusion control the urge for injection common mistake is clinical evaluation and interpretation do not harm the patient thank you very much for your kind attention So I have one question, or uh, would you want to ask Srinivas? Just want it. What are the software related? Uh, you asking? Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, what are some software related artifacts in OCT, and what are some of some artifacts which you see in some particular diseases too? So artifacts are of various types. i am not going into oct angiography fortunately or unfortunately my talk was on oct not oct angiography oct angiography there can be a presentation by itself on artifacts in oct angiography and it is not that useful in routine clinical practice but yes artifacts can be of various types 
there can be inversion artifact, especially high mass. I showed uh, some of the cases. Then you can have in very high reflective lesions. Uh, supposing you have even a blood vessel, so you may interpret it as some lesion if there is a shadowing behind it. Uh, so uh, signal strength also plays an important part. Sometimes uh, you may miss on some uh, 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 lesions which are otherwise picked up. High reflective dots uh, can also cause uh, shadowing effect, especially if you're looking, looking at the choroidal images. Uh, you need to be careful to look at what the retinal pathology is showing if you're looking at the choroidal vasculature to look at specific diagnosis. So you should be, I don't think you have any software to remove in OCT alone, but OCT angiography, there are softwares which can remove all the artifacts or most of the artifacts. We shall go on to our next speaker, Dr. Naresh Babu from Arvind Eye Care Systems Madurai, who's going to be talking on approach to cataract patient with diaptic macular edema. Thank you, Dr. Rajnarayan. That was a wonderful talk. Stay with us. Uh, thank you, madam. Hope uh, the slides are visible. I am yeah. audible also. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Srinivas. Actually, uh, long time back, I have read the advertisement for this Amarchitra Katha. Five brothers fought against 100 cousins. So it is an ad for uh, Mahabharata. So the bottom line says if Mahabharata is so simple, it wouldn't have been an epic like that. It's a bit difficult for me to cover everything in six minutes. And of course, the title is Approach to Cataract Surgery in Eyes with Diabetic Macular Edema. There are two ways of approaching it. One is from the anti-segment surgeon's point of view. The other one is from the post-segment surgeon's point of view, which I'll be talking actually. So how the anti-segment surgeon's uh, uh, approach, I really uh, don't know, because many times we get the cataracts done and then come to us. So the problem with the cataracts in diabetics is the prevalence of uh, cataract in diabetics is quite high. It is almost five times or fivefold more than that of the non-diabetics. And if, the, if you come across a cataract in patients less than 40 years, the prevalence of diabetes is almost 15 to 25 times than that in the general population. So diabetics are very, I mean, uh, prone for this cataracts. The preoperative precautions which we have to take in these cases are basically the endophthalmitis, uh, because they are associated with the high risk of endophthalmitis. So we have to go for a good uh, uh, glycemic control before taking them for cataract surgery, and there should not be any evidence of uh, ocular or periocular infection when you go for the surgery. And in intraop considerations, the basic thing is like uh, FECO embolization is a better one. And uh, because the anterior capsular phimosis is uh, quite common in these cases, we have to go for a larger capsular rexis. And pu pupils dilate very poorly, so you can go for the iris expanders or whatever it may be. And they are also prone for uh, keratoepitheliopathy in, uh, when they go for this uh, cataract surgery. The eye well of the choice usually is the large diameter uh, thing. The one which you, we want to avoid is a silicone lens because subsequently if the patient requires a vitrectomy, if we are going to inject uh, silicone oil, that's going to be a problem. So uh, the cataract surgery and DME, the cataract surgery in diabetics is associated with increased risk of uh, post-surgical edema or there can be worsening of the pre-existing edema. So if you have a pre-existing edema, you can treat and you can go for. Almost 22% of these diabetic patients will develop some form of macular edema after cataract surgery. And this has to be explained to the patient because they might be thinking that they lost the vision because of the cataract surgery. And irvin gas syndrome is almost four times uh, very common in case of uh, diabetics when they undergo cataract surgery. So this is one of the multi-centric, uh, I mean, study from DRCRnet, actually in Eyes with the DRC, I mean diabetic retinopathy with the non CI central involving DME immediately prior to the cataract surgery. So they may have the, I mean, uh, the treatment may increase the risk of developing CI DME 16 weeks after the cataract extraction. So the timing of diabetic macular edema treatment, what we have to do is you can treat the macular edema adequately before the surgery. So there are two trends actually. Early, the trend was to extract the cataract till the DCVA was uh, 20 by 100 or 20 by 200 due to DME development, and then they go for the cataract surgery. But now the trend is you go for the early cataract surgery 
so that you can identify and uh, treat the DME quite early because in the presence of uh, your uh, cataract, it's difficult to do a proper OCT also. Now, OCT is being the guiding thing for uh, treating all these macular lesions. I think a clear media is better. So it's better to go for the earlier cataract surgery and then to treat them. Again, in the post DME, you have to differentiate that from uh, erythema gas syndrome because in case of a diabetic macular edema, you will be having uh, the background changes and uh, exudations. And the OCT can also differentiate that whether it's a DME or just an erythema gas syndrome. And as far as management is concerned, now actually we have got an armamentorium right from the ranibzumab to ILIA to uh, trimension alone. So in case of bevacizumab, actually this is the result so the short-term result says that uh, IV bevacizumab prevents the diabetic macular edema and also reduces the CFT of eyes with the DME after cataract surgery. So in case if you inject this after the cataract surgery, so you can go for uh, IVB if it is available. So this is about the CMP and I mean the BCV in these cases, or we can go for uh, ranibzumab or it's uh, biosimilars in these cases. So in patients undergoing uh, ranibzumab treatment for DME, and had a cataract surgery, they usually, I mean, uh, gain two lines from the, uh, I mean, pre-op surgery uh, at the end of one month. Mm -hmm. So you can go for either bevacizumab, and there is a trial on uh, subtenan versus intravitreal, but usually subtenans are not given much nowadays. We go for intravitreal. So if you take both the BCVA and uh, the, uh, what do you call the central, uh, macular thickness, there's not much of difference between the two, but anyhow, we usually prefer uh, IVT in these cases, but there is always a chance of uh, raised intraocular pressure in these cases. So the other one is you can have either uh, one of these two, either a bevacizumab or triamcinolone injected for this, but again, the problem is... Presentation has a lot of overlap in this presentation, so there's no economic... Yeah, you have to ignore that sound. Okay, okay. So... Uh, there is a sustained reduction in the central macular thickness if you are using a triamcinolone acetate when you are injecting this in the patients with the diabetic macular edema during the time of cataract surgery. The other, the last choice which we usually prefer is uh, the what do you call Osildex, which is a depot release. When you do that uh, concurrently, the results are quite good. So. In diabetic patients with macular edema and usually significant cataract, if you combine the FACO with the Osildex, it is uh, better compared to FACO without uh, what you call Osildex with macular edema. So it's better we can go for these things. But only thing is the cost of the FACO emulsification with the Osildex will be escalated and affordability will become poorer actually. So these are some of the cases where we have done a concurrent uh, what you call the uh, treatment of uh, cataract with the macular edema. But most of these patients, even though we say HbA1c uh, less than 10 is preferable, in many of these cases, above 7, they don't do well actually following, um, I mean, cataract surgery. And usually they'll be having dyslipidemia and uh, uh, what you call uh, uh, the renal problem also. So this was the baseline vision when we started off. The patient was given a dexamethasone implant. So at the end of one month, this was the status of macular. Still, you can find a lot of hard exudates. The vision improved to 6.6, six, and the pre op vision may be reduced because of uh, what you call uh, the. Sir, I request you to please conclude. Yeah. So this is one of the problems. Like when uh, we want to treat a patient prior to the cataract surgery with the uh, dexamethasone, this is what has happened. The. Uh, Implant was directly injected into the lens, and this patient was taken for surgery next day free of cost. In fact, we released the dexamethasone implant, and it was just pushed into the vitreous cavity. A pass plan lensectomy was done, and IOL was impl implanted in these cases. So to conclude, actually, any of these uh, agents can be used, but the dexamethasone implant is a choice, but care must be taken to avoid uh, accidental injection uh, into the lens if you are injecting pre-op. Uh, and of course, so the chances of posterior capsular rent is very high and uh, during the cataract surgery because of, uh, I mean, sorry, uh, the migration of this dexamethasone. So uh, in conclusion, actually, it's better to go for uh, post-op treatment of diabetic macular demand, take the cataract uh, yearly in these cases.
Thank you. Dr. Avinash, I have a very simple question for you, to you after hearing all of what he said. What is the role of intravitreal steroids with a cataract surgery in a diabetic patient? No, I can. Uh, it's a very good question because we know that, as Naresh has spoken, if there is a even non uh, center involving macular edema, the chances of uh, macular edema happening after cataract surgery is very high. Uh, and because the chemokines do get liberated, the various types of chemokines do get liberated. Now, uh, from that point of view, we have to take adequate precautions. And uh, I do believe in my patients, I do advise uh, concomitant intravitreal uh, steroid injections, uh, whether it's going to be triamcin alone or if it's going to be dexamethasone, uh, irrespective of what uh, the patient can afford. But if the patient has diabetic retinopathy with a non-center involving uh, or center involving, I do advise concomitant intravitreal steroid. I don't prefer the uh, anti-VEGF as the first because it is very target specific. It just takes care of one chemokine because uh, there's a lot of other chemokines that get liberated. Steroid would be the drug of choice and it takes care in the next three months. Thank you. That was a good answer. Our next speaker is Dr. Sudarshan from Shankar Netralia, Chennai, who's going to be talking on management of cataract in UVI patients. On to you, Dr. Sudarshan. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Thanks uh, for taking me into this. Can I start off? Yes. Yes, sir. For some, um, actually, including me, probably something uh, like this in the fundus, if I see, then I get too excited. Uh, we have Srinivas here who probably gets excited over these things. So, for some others, when they see the disc or uh, things yes. like this, then uh, yes. eyeball keeps moving here and there, or in the disc, uh, more and more get, becomes more pale, they get uh, excited. But for most, if not all, Something like this is mouth-watering. So when you have something dilated like this, NS2, PSE, then uh, that's a breadwinner for most of us. And when you have these premium IOs, then it's uh, topping, creaming on that. But uh, being UAD specialist, God smiles even at us. They give us something called Fuchs UAD cataracts, which seem to be the easiest among all of them. Uh, so that we do the excess and if you get away with it, then that's fine. But not always though, you know, like say we have uh, want to show off that we do all these complicated ones also. So for us to be smiling even after UAT cataract surgeries, it's better we follow some preferred practice uh, guidelines so that we don't uh, uh, come out uh, dull after the surgery. The challenges in the management of uh, UAT cataracts, uh, the most important thing is the control of inflammation preoperatively and make sure the systemic status of the patient is controlled. Intraoperatively, you have a lot of things. The cornea can have BSK, the pupils, posterior sinica. We need to make the pupil better. Eye risks can bleed, postoperative complications. So it's important that you manage them, uh, plan them very well. So I'll try to break it up into a significant point about the preoperative assessment, intraoperative and postoperative. Preoperatively, it's better to have a to-do list. Most of the time, cataract may not be the only cause of vision loss, but make sure that cataract is also contributing to vision loss. You have PAM, ultrasound, UBM, which can decide about things. Make sure that the physician uh, fitness is taken, plan the additional procedures. But the most important thing among uh, everything about the preoperative uh, management is about the disease activity. It's important to have a, at least two to three months information free period with or without maintenance therapy. Like some people have a feeling that, okay, you'll have to get back the steroid to zero and then only continue it as uh, disease free activity. Inflammation free uh, period is very important. Adequate perioperative cover, preferably oral steroids or uh, in addition, subtenants can be given. Antiviral, if at all the patient is a, a prior uh, viral uveitic patient, antiviral cover is must, but ATD antitoxo is not mandatory. Steroid cover, we usually give oral steroids. Uh, in, we increase pre, uh, in the perioperative period along with or sometimes with subtenones. If, if the patient says of PKH or sympathetic ophthalmia where the patient is on immunal, immunomodulators or biologicals, then uh, it has to continue. Ozotex is a very good option. It's an alternate option. Currently, we've been, uh, you know, the numbers are uh, definitely better than before. The best thing they say is about two weeks prior, but it's about two, two procedures. Adequate inflammatory effect is there at the time of surgery, but the problem is if you have a rent or anything, the Ozotex comes up into the AC. So intraoperative uh, Ozotex is the best option probably. Logistically speaking, it's a single procedure. Steroid effect lasts in the post-operative period also. But uh, remember that it has to be in select situations. Unilateral intermediate uveitis or systemic contraindication for oral steroid, that's a good option. But whenever uh, there's an underlying systemic disease, it's always better to have a systemic uh, steroid cover. So how mandatory is this? So, something like JIA, where the longer the better of uh, inflammation free period, even a few years is better. VK, sympathetic ophthalmia, or HLAB27, all these things, it's very mandatory. But something, uh, some uveitis which is old, old heel coriditis, or even fugues, you can probably get away without a 
to your governor with the mandatory one and they can decide post operatively but don't delay surgery in uh, lens individuated or associated glaucoma or uh, where you need rd surgery this is one patient where it was arn and progressively the lens haze started becoming uh, more and we couldn't follow up the patient also so fast so where you need to visualize and uh, manage the posterior segment pathology plan it up early intraoperatively the most important thing is the pupil size and the capsule have adequately sized and retained pupil during surgery that's the most important one you can do it with uh, many things you can either probably use a cube lens uh, if you can get away with a moderate size uh, pupil or if you have uh, uh, if you can uh, have minus sphincter tears and continue with it if you, uh, the most of the time most of us use uh, uh, grisha burs because it uh, although it can tent up the iris it can definitely have a retained larger sized pupil nowadays off late i've i've been a big fan of uh, suvens uh, b hex ring so most of the time uh, if it's a moderate size pupil i think when you start growing you start becoming less uh, uh, bold and then even moderate size pupil you want some kind of retainer and uh, ease of use uh, insertion and ex uh, removal is easier the false chamber uh, shallowing of the anterior chamber is not there in uh, b hex rings ultimately it is, uh, you need to individualize which one is better for you capsule uh, uvt uvt capsules are soft friable and they, they easily run stain it whenever it's required when it is total cataract or when the glow is even more something like this is the this is a sunset glow of a vkh capsular phimosis uh, chances are lesser if you make a large size capsular excess because in uvt case uh, phimosis chances are higher and can tilt or displace the iul staining capsule doesn't stain your image remember that you can have an intumescent cataract uh, in fuchs remember the flag sign it uh, you need to decompress it and you, if you are comfortable i use the kimuras most of the time than a uh, uh, utrata it's not always that uh, capsules are so friable sometimes it can even be uh, fibrous and membranous uh, like this it can be very thick you need to puncture it cut it with a varnas and uh, do it away with it you can even continue uh, using uh, cutting it or extending the rexus after using the iol also phaco is relatively easy in, all, in not in all patients it is harder except in something like hansens or elderly grandmothers but remember that endothelial protection has to be there intraocular lens preferably preferably acrylic in the bag single piece in the sulcus never peripheral iridectomy i don't do it routinely but in patients at risk of glaucoma or in shallow eyes then you can probably do a peripheral iridectomy it's not over till it's over that's what they say post operatively uh, last few slides monitor the iop and inflammation the post operative steroids need to be continued and be aware of the complications such as the post op fibrin iol cystoid macular edema most importantly manage the primary disease that's most important the cataract surgery is over it doesn't mean that's uh, the end of the thing for the patient uatic uh, disease has to be managed primarily so to conclude the uat cataracts need special attention the pre operative period inflammation free period is a must varies accordingly um, the longer it is the better but in children it's better that you plan the amblyopic part of it also intraoperative ozotex is an alternate option in select situations iol in the bag acrylic heterophobic gives the best results and uh, most importantly to repeat manage the primary entity after the surgery also thank you uh, <clears throat> thank you very much dr sudarshan dr atul kumar you are there dr lalit verma yeah uh, i am here so uh, one question i wanted to ask uh, sushan, i wanted to ask a question to you dr lalit first let me ask first to sushan because i have already planned that <laughs> you are <laughs> hearing is uh, rapid fire talk such fast and so much information what is your take on uh, you see uh, uh, putting ozuris at the time of uvt cataract surgery yes so off late we been uh, using a uh, few of them like compared to the surgery which we do with uh, oral steroid cover ozodex and the phaco is much lesser definitely but in patients who had a long long standing uh, uh, remission who don't seem to be reacting that badly especially in the milder uvt cataracts like intermediate uvts or unilateral ones ozodex is a better option yeah. if it is a case of a juvenile idiopathic arthritis now how would you prevent uh, secondary cataract formation more than some more points than what you've already said actually the last uh, um, couple of slides were about pediatric uvt cataracts i just deleted it just before i started off most important thing is uh, in gia uh, <clears throat> we need to actually have a larger inflammation free period so the most important uh, thing among them is uh, what we have seen we have we have a study where the adolescent age group seem to be doing much better than the younger age group but uh, <clears throat> earlier immunosuppressive therapy is better avoiding topical steroids are better 
these things prevent early cataract formation in JA associated rheumatism. Sir, I have a question. Sir, posterior capsular excess and little bit of anterior vitrectomy also. Uh, PPC, uh, we we opt for PPC especially the patient is uh, if the child is less than six or seven years old. When it is uh, yagable or like when they are, can be cooperative for yag, then probably we don't need to do a PPC. Anterior vitrectomy, like not always we need to do. That's what I feel because uh, for a PPC, the aim is to have a um, clear visual access. Sir, in case of uh, non-infectious uveitis or JIA, who is going for a pediatric cataract, then how early you start the systemic steroids in these cases? And secondly, if the patient is diabetic, then would you prefer going for oral steroid and increasing the insulin or going for any methods like PST injection or intravitreal IVTA or uh, intravitreal dexamethasone? The first part is uh, about the JIA, uh, when the inflammation is active, then probably that is the time we need to give uh, oral steroids or uh, uh, systemic steroid therapy. But uh, simultaneously, uh, JA is a primary immunosuppressive therapy indication. So if at all, uh, on JA and basis are two diseases where you need to give biologicals or your threshold for biologicals is much lower. But immunomodulators like methotrexate works very well. So start off with methotrexate simultaneously along with uh, uh, steroids in conjunction with a rheumatologist. So and take, take off the steroids as early as possible so that the disease is under control with immunomodulators. And in uh, for the second diabetics with steroids, uh, diabetics with cataracts and uh, uveitis, that's what depends on the primary uveitic disease. If it's some uh, weak age or base age or sympathetic ophthalmia, they really uh, act very badly postoperatively. The chances of uh, complications are much higher. So in that case, it's okay to use uh, insulin, reduce uh, it. Maybe you can reduce the dosage of oral steroids, add the PST for it. But uh, have perioperative steroid cover always. Postoperatively, inflammation is lesser. You can stop steroids. Can I make a comment? Yes, yes sir. doctor. Uh, this is a, uh, uveitic cataract with hypotony would be a very big challenge. And in such cases, UVM may be required. And if there is a lot of cyclotic membrane, one may do a, instead of cataract extraction, one may need to do a vitrectomy and remove the fractions and membranes. So that is one of the options. One of the slides that went like lightning was that slide, sir, actually. Like whether you need to decide about fake or lens. Switch. Have to go on to our next slide. speaker. Thank you very much for your talk. Our next speaker is Dr. Srinivas Joshi, who's going to be talking on intravitreal in inje injection methodology, the what, when, and how of these injections. Thank you, Chitra, madam. Uh, thanks for the invitation, uh, AIOS and our dynamic chairman, Dr. Chitra Ramurthy. So here I'll be talking a little bit about the intravitreal injections. We all know there is a plethora of uh, anti available now. We have the unlicensed bevacizumab, then we have renibizumab, now aflibercept, and now what we have is the brolizumab, which shows that if the molarity, if you see, it's slightly high as compared to the other injection and periodically making it slightly more potent. We also have a list of biosimilars available. The list goes on and on. We have razumab, zivoflibercept, biosimilar, avastins are also being started now. So what are the indications of the intravitreal injections? So basically, any, any form of uh, CNVM, age-related macular degeneration, whether it's a myopic, classic, or a macular edema due to vein occlusion, pseudophagic PME. Let me uh, start with an example. This is the case where the patient had a polyp here. You can see very nicely under the OCT. And you can see under the OCTA, you can see a neovascular pattern here. And uh, FFA and ICG was done, and uh, which was corresponding to this po portion that was the polyp here. The second one was also corresponding to the same. OCTA showed the dead tree appearance on type 1 CNV and OCTA. So these cases actually do well with uh, either with aflibercept or with the new kid on the block that is the brolizumab rather than uh, simply trying on renibizumab in these cases. The other cases where these two injections work well is the case of occult CNVM. See here you can see another lady with a multi-layered PED with a type 1 CNVM and also you can see a, a neovascular network in this case. And post-injection, you can see there is a good response, which was earlier not responding to ranibzumab. So occult CNVM PCVs are good for these two injections, which I mentioned. The other forms of ARMD where ranibzumab can play a role is the case of classic CNVM, where it uh, plays nicely. But again, this is the case of occult CNVM. And uh, the protocol S, that is the primary outcome of the study, well, that was the ranibzumab was non-inferior. Even though I'm not a great fan of injecting uh, anti vegf in these cases where they have a mild vitreous hemorrhage or PDR, but here you can see this patient, when I tried it, both eyes uh, can be put on anti vegf rather going for surgery is what they say. But this patient had a good uh, uh, thing. This is the right eye and the left eye. And uh, this is the edema also along with it. And the patient did really well. There was slight uh, clearing of the vitreous hemorrhage. But again, uh, the, it recurred back and we had to do a vitrectomy and laser. Now coming to the CRBO, this is a case of uh, 
uh, CRBO where you can see there is a macular edema on the OCT here. So what to inject when in grade one and grade two CRBOs, usually any kind of anti-VEGF really works well. But when it comes to grade three, it's not better to give an anti-VEGF injection. In those cases, the Osurdex or the long-term DEX implants really work well in those cases. Now there's another new terminology as Raja sir was telling, there's a uh, continuous term that keeps on coming. This is the suspended scattering particles in motion observed by OCT angiography that is called as SSPIM. And this was the case I just took today when I was referring this case in the morning. This patient was injected Osurdex. Although there was a subphobial fluid had uh, come back, but this cystoid space did not come back. And you, see, you can see the SSPIM in this case in the cystoid. And the OCTA also, you, you can see here, this is the uh, what they say is the lateral extension when they extend into the FAZ zone. And that is when they call it as SSPIM. In these cases, neither antivegefs, neither Osurdex really work well, but Osurdex does help well in case of decreasing the steroid uh, cystoid spaces. Now, another indication is DME. Usually now we give intravitative injection in almost all cases of fovea involving diabetic macular edema. And this post one month, you can see there is a definitely good uh, improvement. But there are other features called as the recalcitrant DME where there is a large cystoid spaces. Like in these cases, you can see the tall cystoid spaces, especially when the giant, when it is more than 200 microns or when there is a hyperreflective foci that as many as 21, I don't know who counts it, but uh, the, the paper says that if there is more than 21, they have a slightly poor prognosis with anti and they do well with the steroids. And the subretinal, subretinal uh, deposits, uh, here you can see that the cholesterol deposits, that, that they, those patients are also, they say that they go well with the Osurdex and we keep injecting that in most of these patients. Uh, there are other uh, various uh, indications like radiation retinopathy, choroidal mets, ROP, Coats disease, VHL, CSR, and so on. So let's look into, uh, this is the one of the video where I prefer doing it in this way, where I just try to uh, put a small, uh, I put a small uh, kind of lignocaine uh, uh, the, the, uh, five minutes before the injection. And then I just uh, open up. Uh, putting the speculum and I put a 5% uh, betadine uh, iodine, especially in the suprotemporal area first, and then going on with the rest of the painting, the rest of the part. And we have to make sure that the eyelashes are also painted well. And the, most of the studies, metal analytic studies have shown that 30 seconds to one minute of covidine iodine is good enough in killing about 91% of the uh, uh, conjunctival flora, bacteria, the conjunctival flora. So here uh, we take a 4 mm if it's a pay kick and uh, 3.5 mm uh, pseudo fake and then we go ahead with uh, giving the injection and the one thing we have to make sure is after doing that we have to give a good wash because betadine is very irritant we are getting a good wash is very important the patient is very happy there are uh, complications like end of intraocular inflammation which is hemorrhage persistent floaters and then on so if you are suspecting an end end of thalmitis the most important we need to remember is a b c d e rule a is for antibiotics, B is for betadine wash, C is for reconstitution, D is for dosage, distance, direction, and decompression, and E is for visual acuity. Of course, the preferred choice is gram positive is vancomycin and cefazolin, gram negative is amikacin, gentamicin, and cefazolin. If it is not curable, then you can go into any other uh, higher antibiotics. And uh, antifungals, we prefer ampotericin or voriconazole. My preferred practice is voriconazole of 100 microgram in 0.1 ml. Next one, as I said, is betadine wash. And as I said, it decreases the conjunctival flora to around 91%. And reconstitution, I'll not go into the detail because most of us will be having it or either put it in the situation theater, that is ciptazidine, amicus in various uh, combinations. And my last video, I'll be ending it within 30 seconds. Here you can see here the case of endophthalmitis. So instead of removing the needle and put it, so what I advise to the general ophthalmologist, whoever, so please refer these patients to the VR surgeons because they handle it much better. So in these cases, what I do is I, I just uh, put a syringe to the hub. I, I loosely attach it because I want to put two or three injections, uh, preferred injections. Although some authors uh, prefer using the two and three pricks, but uh, with the one prick, it can be good enough. Uh, you can remove it and then place the, the other rest of the injection. So, so uh, lastly, I would like to say in, in case of any endophthalmitis to all the general ophthalmologists who are listening here, never lose faith because if plan A fails, there are still 25 alphabets. Thank you very much for the patient listening. Very good talk, Srinivas. You covered it all. Uh, just one question. Why would you not think of start uh, stopping anticoagulants uh, for intravitreal injections? Uh, in fact, uh, uh, we, don't, we don't do it in, in any of the cataract surgery because it's less bloodless surgery, right? We don't, uh, in fact, 
many patients ask whether in the intravitreal surgery also you use it but as the dictum goes that okay you can stop the anticoagulants because the chance of the rebleed might be high immediate post stop but for anti intravitreal injections i don't prefer to stop any uh, anticoagulant or aspirin therapy dr lalit dharma you have any question for him anybody in the panel only thing is i was amazed to see that video where you are painting with uh, in the office you were doing that intravitreal injection uh -huh. so that i could identify see, your face kind of room Uh, where after the, for uh, we are doing it for almost seven years now. It's a semi-sterile kind of room, not a real OT setup, but definitely yeah. we wear gloves, mask, everything is there. And uh, almost we have given twenty thousand injections sir, for now. And uh, touch wood, God's grace. <laughs> Any thoughts on that? Any other person? Something controversial? Uh, Srinivas. Yeah, Sanjay? if I may, uh, Srinivas, you put that needle right in. Uh, yeah, up to the hub, yeah. that can be a little uh, dicey. You know, yeah. I would say still, uh, I think the conventional technique of putting only half, half inch half inside half is better. Distance, uh, is always better. That's yeah. quite a lot. This That's was right. done by my fellow, but half the distance is always better so that it will not uh, poke the other side of the retina. I do yes. agree. Okay, we go on to our next speaker, Dr. Anand Rajendran, heading the retina department of Arvind Eye Care Systems, Chennai, who is going to be talking on lasers in retina, paradigms, pearls, and perils. On to you. Yeah. So, are you able to see my screen? Am I audible? Yes, yes, sir. yes, sir. Okay, so a pleasure to be part of the session. We're going to talk, look at lasers, paradigms, pearls, and perils. So, the applications of lasers in retinal practice are several. Mainly being for diabetic retinopathy, the matters in the uh, uh, proliferative complications less so for diabetic macular edema nowadays with the anti-vegetative therapy that we've. Uh, Shreem has shown us, and for other indications, critically prophylaxis of retinal breaks and ROP tumors and AMD PCV, more with photodynamic therapy there, which I won't really be touching here. So ETS gave us, you know, the classic three uh, criteria for clinically significant macular edema where macular photocoagulation is indicated. These are the parameters we aim for: uh, grade one burns. It showed us that uh, laser reduced risk of moderate vision loss by 50% in three years. Equity improved only by about uh, by 15 letters and only 3% uh, of the patients and 12% still developed moderate vision loss despite treatment. And which is why uh, anti-vegetative therapy holds sway. And the surviving indications for lasers in macular edema, non-center involving diabetic macular edema and focal ablation of the microaneurysms. On the other hand, band retinal photocoagulation of PRP still holds uh, uh, the gold standard status for PDR. Uh, the protocol S um, five-year outcomes notwithstanding, I think in a developing country like India, PRP permanent ablative therapy still holds good. You can do it uh, using these parameters uh, with a slit lamp or a laser IO uh, um, setup. The mechanism action: you convert the hypoxic tissue into anoxia. More oxygen is available for the inner retina. You decrease the vasoinhibitory factors, thus primarily VEGF. Laser photocoagulation also indicated for retinal vascular occlusions. Uh, sector uh, um, photocoagulation for uh, BRVOs complete for central retinal vascular occlusions in cases of retinal neovascularization and anterior segmental neovascularization like rubiosus here. Pattern scan laser or Pascal delivers a multi-spot PRP, and this is increasingly being popular, especially in heavy uh, clinics. Multiple uniform patterned uh, laser burns are delivered by single foot pedal depression, barely visible 10 to 30 millisecond burns produces an effect of the ellipsoid zone and the apical RP with minimal axial and lateral sped, this reduced scarring, scotoma and inflammation. Therefore, and because it takes less time, there is significantly lower levels of patient anxiety, pain and photophobia. Different patterns can be chosen. There's more uniform uptake across retina. Endpoint management can be affected. Uh, uh, versions coming now with so that some of the central spots can be titrated in power. Navilus or uh, navigated laser is also around. It allows imaging of the macula with fundus photography and fluorescein FFA overlaid. So then you can plan the treatment by directly among the areas to treat and you can selectively target the ischemic areas and this is targeted retinal photocoagulation as opposed to the traditional technique where you keep looking at an angiogram on a different monitor, flipping between that and the patient's eye and mentally inverting the image. So this comes with the infrared mode, this is greater comfort, this better view through a vis hemorrhage, lesser pain, again, uniform laser uptake across retina. Subthreshold micropulse laser is something which has really caught on in the last maybe half a decade. In this micropulse mode, the laser 
is delivered in ultra short pulses microseconds now this is shorter than the thermal relaxation time of the target tissue and the temperature rise is insufficient to cause collateral damage to the surrounding retinal tissue and this minimizes scarring to the extent the lasers are invariably undetectable there's a 4 to 10 fold lower energy per pulse and therefore you don't see all the other complications that you see often with conventional laser uh in this uh, modality the yellow 57 nanometer is outside the absorption spectrum of xanthophils potentially therefore allowing for foveal treatment you can paint the fovea and you can do it really mechanism each microspurs stimulates the compromised rp cells and promotes its restoration lasers for dr these are the lasers we have the conventional uh, 532 uh, and the green laser and the new kid in the block the iq 57 where we prefer the 5% duty cycle focal laser for focal leaks csr very much in vogue the uh, subthreshold microspurs laser and the green laser have been shown to have equivalent efficacy but what's more important is that with the subthreshold microspurs yellow laser you do not see that tissue trace of the laser on the autofluorescence maps as you can see here uh, is seen very much with the green laser so therefore it's much less tissue toxic critical uh, use of lasers barrage for retinal breaks or shoot tears retinal holes other indications being for retinopathy of prematurity the uh, late uh, ischemic zones in the periphery tumor ablation especially retinoblastoma yag hyaluronotomy where you evacuate the premacular uh, subiloid hemorrhage and for epithelial exudative vitreoid retinopathy and various other indications here you read the peripheral vascular zones the perils of laser we talked about the good things the perils too complications of photocoagulation both anterior and posterior segment can be seen you can have in the anterior segment elevated iop corneal damage iris and lens burns loss of accommodation in the posterior segment you can have extended <laughs> sudden movement of the eye localization of the foveal center this is a case which came in some hence for a long time back when you're doing focal or prp you need to anesthetize the eye well at all times for beginners use a barrier marker go from the posterior to the anterior direction this is very important and keep checking the orientation subfoveal fibrosis can happen heavy lasers especially when they are repeated over hard exudates hemorrhages avoid intense burns retreatment and reduce concomitantly serum lipid profile choroidal subretinal and vitreous hemorrhages can happen this is because of small intense short duration burns causing rupture of the choroidal or retinal vessels managed by increasing the iop you can just press on the globe uh, prevention is again use larger spots are longer duration and lesser wavelengths celochoroidal detachments can happen rarely this is because of alteration of the fluid dynamics in choroidal circulation following inflammation due to laser and something similar can also happen with detached exudative retinal detachments it's on a similar mechanism risk factors are the same hypertension <laughs> hypertension renal failure heavy laser burns uh, topical periocular steroids can be used uh it's sometimes they can resolve by themselves prevention is avoid giving heavy lasers multiple sessions of prp less in or it could be in spot specific especially in pigmented eyes like ours and especially in nephropathy patients where you may have to uh, divide into multiple sessions internal ophthalmoplegia can be seen damage to parasympathetic nerves in suprachoroidal space pain is a real thing it's happened because you're you're photocoagulating those nerves there stect iris palsies lightning dissociation accommodated parasites so avoid giving these heavy confluent drones especially in these horizontal meridians and avoid the long wavelength Base of vagal attacks can happen, especially in young and anxious patients. And you prevent manage that by repeat reassurances. Stop the laser patients feeling sweaty or feeling blue in a dark room. So be aware of that if a patient is hyper anxious. Brief pause, a glass of cold water, extreme fainting. Use the frontal lobe position monitoring of the vitals. You can mimic myocardial infarction and other episodes or a seizure. So and then laser is very much a key therapeutic modality in the uh, armamentarium of retinal surgery for all these. Yeah, we're done. for all these indications that we have just uh, looked at thank you uh, just one question to you dr avinash what is uh, one thing which was not discussed is the navigated uh, laser thing which is coming yeah. up and so i wanted to ask dr avinash patanje to say a couple of lines on that uh, sorry uh, no in terms of navigated laser i think raja would be better because oh, yes. uh, he has a better experience with navigated laser dr raja फोविया <laughs> and uh, you can just uh, input beforehand itself that you want to hit these microaneurysms 
or even the PRP, it will do it for you. Whatever you have marked according to the power settings, it will do it for you. Yeah. You Very can much, be adding yeah. to your calculator. Uh, I deleted all those slides because Dr. Chitra wanted only six minutes. <laughs> but but uh, what is your take on this TRP, sir? I have never found anything much uh, uh, great results with the TRP, especially in case of chronic recurrent uh, CRVOs or diabetic macular edemas. Anand, sir? So, I mean, there are papers which have shown benefit and non-equivalence. So, I mean, uh, there are, I, I personally, we don't have the navelas, but uh, we've uh, not seen. Any, any yeah, yeah, I understand. I understand. But there are, there is uh, evidence to show that it is at so least equivalent. Personal, not, uh, personal opinion, sir. So, I, I mean, I, I don't do it regularly, but I think there is value to be had in, uh, you know, lesser tissue destruction. Anything that is lesser tissue destruction can show equivalence of effect. I think there's value to be had there. Thank you. So our next speaker is Dr. Atul Kumar, who needs no introduction, is absolute the top ophthalmologist of our country and is going to be telling us preferred practice guidelines for past planar vitrectomy. Look forward to hearing from you, doctor. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, it's a pleasure to be in your uh, prestigious ARC course. And uh, you uh, honor, I feel honored that you've invited me to be a part of this in the AOS, in the AOS meeting, which is be, being held so well by all of you, you were invited me to be part of this uh, preferred practice pack, practice guidelines, which are very helpful, I think, for the general ophthalmologists and also for the residents. So I just talked to you in short, as has been advised, we have a short meeting, a short uh, talk with some discussion, and then the basic principles of vitreoretinal surgery and indications for diabetic vitrectomy. So. So you got to understand the uh, general ophthalmologist or for the, for the beginners, for the beginners, it's very important to understand the vitreoretinal surgery is fundamentally different from other anterior segment and other microsurgeries. For that matter, even strabismus surgery, that the posterior fundus is not visualized, is Im imp impossible to visualize until you have adjuncts. So those adjuncts are, can be in the form of uh, certain contact lenses, like, the, like here you see the flat lens, the chalam lens from KV chalam, Indian who settled in the US who's got these four flanged four flanged contact lens which neutralizes the corneal power of 44 and so you can visualize the retina magnified in the center which is about 30 to 50 degrees and you can move the eye to see the mid periphery. So this Chalam lens is a great help because it keeps the lens anchored onto the uh, cornea because the flanges prevent the lens from slipping away. So this kind of uh, adjuncts really help. These are other adjuncts which increase the illumination or give you a double. You can do bimanual. Otherwise, all vitrectomies are one-handed. One-handed means there's only one active instrument. The other instrument's holding the light. The light pipe instrument is a passive or a non-functional hand. It could be your left or right hand, depending on whether you uh, what kind of surgery you're doing. And so, uh, the putting a fourth port is a chandelier light, which I often do, and I recommend a lot that you should do, uh, get used to do, uh, using the chandelier and buy, buy a machine which you have a facility to, to attach a side, fourth uh, for a second, a light, separate light so that you can do uh, surgery with, with both active hands. Then another thing uh, very, very important is the previous lens I showed you was only for the macula. But then you need a lot of panoramic viewing for the retina because you want to see the retina of the giant ear, or the periphery, what's it showing like, and what's the 360 degrees? What's what's at nine o'clock? What's at twelve? So we got diabetic eyes or uh, detachment eyes or many other eyes. You have various findings, which may be missed on until you don't have a wide-angle viewing system. So you can have a non-contact wide-angle viewing. It's also called waves wide-angle viewing system. Non-contact, which is like here, you have the three sight attached to the no no pro, no financial interest to the uh, Zeiss microscope. Or you have the contact wide angle, like you have the mini quad XL from Vogue. And so all the technical machines for a beginner or for somebody who's going to invest, for a resident who's going to go into practice uh, or wants to buy an equipment for his eye center, he should have a linear suction cutting available in the machine or a di dual dynamic drive. He should have a good illumination, a xenon light or a LED light. He should have a facility for vented, for, uh, no, he should have viscous fluid injector. That means oil should be automatically injected and extracted. 
and then you got a duty cycle control i'm not going to the details of this what happens is when you're at a very high cut rate the port should not close so uh, it's a open bias and closed bias duty cycle which you have in some of the machines in which the port will not close despite you're working at very high cut rates that's a duty cycle control the flow and suction should control should be there in vented gas force infusion is something gas is forced through the infusion bottle which is maybe bss plus like i use bss plus i'll con so the vented vgfi helps you to be increase the iop from suddenly from uh, 15 into uh, 15 mm mercury fluid pressure to 20 to 60 so i can stop the bleeders in cases of diabetic vitrectomies which we, we do a lot which i like to do a lot which i do a lot because of the number of case number of cases and if the air pressure is 40 then of course it goes up to 60 so the vgfi can be switched on and off uh, don't keep it on for too long because you might get disc pallor and then you got a built in laser if it's you really want to go in for a high end machine you better have a built in laser because that really helps you to work through a single machine and a lot of ease of patient friendly surgeon friendly so i'll go fast now so you have these dumbbell shaped cutters Uh, you know they kind of fit into your fingers and your fingers are resting here so the port the 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 back part of the cutter is a little swollen up or a little wider so that it won't slip through so this is a very nice and they're very very light probes they some kind of a, a acrylic or some plastic which they use but these are these are basically you can do plasma sterilization or eto and uh, they very lightweight they often have a stiffening sleeve because you use these mivs cutters 23 25 27 so they have a stiffening sleeve so as to prevent the uh, shaft from getting bent surgical actually for us like in rp center we have this surgical skill center which i feel that because this kind of a lecture the arc uh, guidelines and uh, preferred practice patterns for the newer beginners and all they should really practice and we have these facilities we have the faco facility as well as a simulator for learning retina surgery also so this is a ic simulated by vr magic where we train our residents to use peeling the membranes or using as if they using a cutter it's like sitting in a uh, you know uh, artificial cockpit and seeing the plane fly so you can sit here and do the work of course it's a little expensive but good for sectors so to start with tech me you got to have a four uh, four Four limb surgery. Please continue. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. So this is how you make the entry point. I'm just finishing in half a minute. So you go in tangentially and go in vertically then, and you endo laser around the break. And these are cryo probes which you should uh, use very carefully. It surely freeze the tip, not the shaft, because it's a recent case where I saw cryo burn of the lid. Because the shaft may have frozen, done somewhere else. So oil or gas is something which you use as a substitute, and uh, this is how we fill up the gas at our place. Or the oil is the vented forced V V V F I, and uh, this is how we operate. Very close to conclude the session. Yes, yes he would. Now don't keep talking. Now just let it be. Yes, doctor, continue. Yeah, so this is now we've come to the twenty twenty five twenty seven gauge with Techme. and these are closed systems and uh, very good because they're like a laparoscopic surgery and the wound uh, heals up very well there's no astigmatism no dry eye and we go transconjunctival so we don't call it transconjunctival or stress we just call it a mivs minimally invasive vitreous surgery so it really it's of great help and uh, now i use this uh, uh, you know like i told you this is the just the last slide which i like to show you with the you know by manual surgery because you got to have a light pipe a separate chandelier so uh, this is a case done very recently so you see i'm finishing in just for 15 uh, seconds so part of the vitrectomy uh, i like to see if i can peel off because the sh- the cutter itself can you can help with the suction you can peel off a part of this fibrovascular tissue this is a taut posterior hyaloid with fibrovascular tissue so part of it i relay uh, release and segment and part of it which i cut so here i'm using a 27 gauge cutter i use a lot of 27 gauge in diabetic vitrectomy you can see 
as i'm making uh, i'm passing the cutter between the plane the correct plane of the retina and the overlying tissue so it helps me to uh, avoid breaks with the 27 gauge cutter the narrow port and also to segment the tissue so you got to segment tissues to relieve the traction this is what i like to do and this case did very well and this was the first day post op and he improved to 636 and now actually it's 612 thank you so much sorry i took a little extra time thank you thank you very much doctor just uh, one very general question uh, when you're doing a fluid air exchange if the posterior surface of the iul starts getting very foggy how hmm. would you deal with it i just put in a little viscoelastic drops couple of drops of with the cannula bent cannula i take viscoelastic and i go through the pass through my trocar uh, tr cannula to so trocar cannula and i just put couple of drops behind a drying of with drying and just uh, the whole thing spreads out and the drying is gets taken care of professor srinivas any question for sir uh, no sir uh, wonderful videos atul sir uh, you described it so nicely that even a common uh, ophthalmologist or general ophthalmologist could understand it so well Uh, and uh, we have Thank seen you. your uh, videos uh, wonderful thank you sir thank you thank you we are enlightened thank to have you. you with us today thank you doctor thank you ma'am thank you for inviting you. our next speaker is none other than our uh, dr chair chair uh, chairman uh, no chairman a great chairman the scientific committee is unbeatable forever and who is going to be our president next year is dr lalit verma who is going to talk on post op endoscopy Six minutes is too little for you. I'll share my screen. So is it visible or? No, you're not. Not. Your, your, your slides are not seen. Oh, where is it? Yes, yes, you are sharing. One second, I think. Where is it? One. You have to give me one minute. I have opened here. I don't know why it is not visible here. Should you take a, a minute? Should we call the next speaker and then you will talk? Yeah, yeah, you can please. Yeah. So I uh, request uh, our next speaker, Dr. Vaishali Gupta, who is going to be talking on simplifying the management of ocular toxoplasmosis, interpretation of lab tests, and various clinical features of toxoplasmosis. Hello. A good evening, and thank you, Chitra, for giving me a topic that will take one minute of my six minutes. It's a long topic. Anyways, talking about toxoplasmosis, it's caused by a protozoan which causes a toxoplasma bondi. Uh, I'm just going to give very few practical tips. The first one is a congenital toxoscar. It's important to know about this scar because many a times the diagnosis like macular colobomas and so many other things are being made out of it. So if you see a scar with a scleral show right in the center, it's just a congenital toxoscar, nothing required. Just tell patient to review SOS because it could get symptoms anytime. Coming to a toxo which is active are inflammatory you may have a active lesion sitting next to a congenital toxo scar so that's what you uh, you know that's what you are afraid of and these are called satellite lesion typical white small with overlying vitreitis the acquired variety of toxo lesions however may not have a scar sitting next to them so don't always look for the presence of the scar typical lesions of toxoplasmosis are retinitis with headlight and fog appearance 
Many a times you may have cryolysis plaques, which are multiple small deposits on the surface of the retinal blood vessels that may be seen either close or even away from the primary lesion and are pointed towards the diagnosis. If it happens in an HIV patient, it may not be very typical. It may be very extensive, necrotic, and may resemble arm. Now, fluorescein angiography, to be very honest, doesn't show you much except that there is retinitis, the lesion which becomes progressively hyperfluorescent in the late phase. However, OCT actually has some of the very important biomarkers. And it's important to know these because I personally don't do fluorescein, I just do only OCT. So if you are seeing hyperreflective opal deposits on the surface of the retina, or you are seeing a posterior hyaloid, which has hyperreflective round deposits along the posterior hyaloid, and especially if they are mirroring. So if you are seeing this mirror image deposits on the hyaloid along with the retina, some retro, retro hyaloid hyperreflective dots and the involvement of the choroid. This is very important. Toxo causes the involvement of retina. So you see retinitis, but there's always retinochoroiditis. So you will see involvement of the underlying choroid in Toxo, unlike in sometimes diffuse lymphomas that might resemble this, or viral retinitis, which commonly resembles it, viral retinitis will not have associated choroidal involvement. Investigations, none. Just clinical. Serology, no. Not definitive. goldman Whitmer coefficient, you could do if you want to, but by and large, not available. PCR is only for atypical cases. So what are the indications? You don't have to treat every lesion simply because it is there. There are indications for treatment. If you have these lesions in the posterior pole, near macula, or optic disc, and the vision is 612 or less, are you feel the vision is going to be threatened? Are you have large lesions that is irrespective of location? I don't have to honestly talk about regimens because it's so much easier to go to the book and read about them. But typically, they have been pyrimethamine, sulfadiazine, and folinic acid all combined together. There may be problems in finding folinic acid at times. So if you are not finding, please don't start this regimen. You could use alternative regimens like Clenda, Spira, Mycid, or other medicines. Very important tip is systemic steroids always start 48 to 72 hours after you have started antitoxotherapy and stop it before you stop antitoxotherapy. The total duration is four to six weeks and I'm talking only of immunocompromised individuals. This is how the lesion good response. On the left, you see vitreitis, general haze, and a patch in the periphery. And this is following treatment with clindamycin with oral steroids that, of course, was added under the cover of clindamycin. This is that patient of cryolysis that I showed you in the beginning. And monitor the response, you see the lesion going down and finally healing. Lot of talk about intravitreal therapy, clinda and dexa injection, and this is how the patient would respond. You can give a weekly injection. Nobody knows how many injection, but it is kind of a PRN kind of a treatment that you see the response and then inject if required. If from history you know it has been recurring time and again, it's time to give systemic prophylaxis which is Septron actually every third day for 20 months, our treatment every other day for one year after you have given 45 days of active treatment for Toxo. Why? This is my last slide. Why is it important to know? This is because this is a patient who presented like this. Somebody did not understand it was Toxo. And oh, I'm finishing this is my last slide. And ended up with a situation like this costing patient a uh, complete visual loss. Thank you very much for your patient hearing.
Dr. Chitra, you are muted. I'm muted, madam. Uh, I think we can take some expert comments from Dr. Jyotirme Biswas, sir. Excellent, madam. In six minutes, you did a fantastic job. Thank you. So the toxolesions, what I look for is the localized vitreous haze. If there's a diffuse vitreous haze, uh, then you have to think for other entities like you know, viral retinitis is a possibility. And uh, as he has been, she has rightly pointed out that do not give intravitreal or posterior subtenone injection thinking that it is a uh, posterior uveitis or pan uveitis because that can be really devastating in such cases, lead to the, some kind of viral retinitis like picture. And reversely also, you should not do that. You should not miss toxo as an ARN as a toxo lesion. Thank you, doctor. Can you share your screen, Dr. Lalit? Yeah, yeah, I can. I'm just looking here. Is it visible now? Yes, yes. Yes, sir. Thank you, Chitra, for having me here for six minutes. Uh, you see, end of is a disaster. Nobody wants to see these patients. I will just run through a couple of uh, patients here only. This is one patient who had had more than uh, usual reaction. In fact, two of them. And uh, here the dictum is whether it is end of or not, because it was referred as end of. So this chart is very helpful for me, where you can try to differentiate between a TAS and an infection and thermitis. And if you're if you're shifting towards TAS, so I do not give any internal antibiotics. I will load this patient with steroids by all possible routes and follow up very very closely, maybe twice a day or so. So this was the first patient which I had shown, and this patient treated with intensive steroids and follow-up. Follow-up is very essential, because any time they can tilt towards uh, endothelmitis. And fortunately, this patient recovered. However, if you have inclination towards endothelmitis, like hypopion, pupil, and exudates are there, and vision is very poor, then immediate injection is required. And what, when, and I think this has been covered by Srinivas also, but presently we all give Venko Kefta, sometimes Venko Amica also. But one for positive and one for negative. And always put this chart in your operation theater wall. And this is one patient who had all the telltale signs. You see, don't expect immediate improvement. It takes a couple of days or weeks for all this synechia to break and supportive treatment and ultimately patient recovers. Important is to keep following them up. Other situation could be that response may not come as great as the previous one. Or the situation will be so bad that patient has PL plus minus kind of vision. That means the load is very, very heavy. In such situations, you can consider intravitreal, but by and large, everybody resorts to vitrectomy. And vitrectomy has to be a radical kind of vitrectomy. And by, because there are two ways of you know, entering. One is that initially, because a lot of these either hypotenuse, we do a needle infusion just to so, so, tighten up the globe and then take a six millimeter cannula. In all this end of eyes, choroid is very thick. So take a six minute cannula so that you are in the intravitreal space before you turn on the infusion. And sometimes it becomes a dicey job also. And the second component after you are inside is to clean up the interior chamber. Because interior chamber, if you don't clean up, then you do a messy job in the vitreous cavity. So two ways are there. One is to go from the pasrena, make a aridectomy, and through that aridectomy, put the cutter inside the interior chamber and remove all these membranes. And before you go inside the vitreous cavity. So this is going from the past minute route. So this video shows that how we put an AC maintainer. You put an AC maintainer because the pupil is small, the cannula was not visible. So we put the AC maintainer here and then put visco to protect endothelium, take this MVR and take a bent needle and tease away this uh, pupillary membrane, which is generally very huge. And after you have peeled away this pupillary membrane, then go inside the vitreous cavity and do a vitrectomy. So these three steps are always to be followed. This is a couple of patients pre and post operatively after radical vitrectomy. Sometimes the IUL removal may be required uh, during the course of vitrectomy. This was one patient who had plus minus kind of vision, resistant to intravitreal antibiotics. So we started doing the vitrectomy for a long time, could not uh, see anything, and ultimately had to remove this uh, membrane from the pupillary area. In the process, IUL got mobilized, remove this IUL, and then uh, suture this wound and remove all the exudates, remove all the connections between the corneal abscess and the intraocular cavity. 
and then do a radical kind of tweak and put in the oil. So this was the same patient after this radical vitrectomy. Fungal and cinematis, by and large, multiple vitrectomy are required unless you are lucky that uh, voriconazole may help or repeated injection of amphotericin. By and large, vitrectomy is multiple vitrectomies are required in these patients. So this is one of post uh, fungal and cinematis, proven fungal and cinematis. We are getting kind of picture will sometimes require removal of the IUL, sometimes it may respond only to in the back kind of injection. So I'll show three examples. One is which responded to intra in, in the back injection of Anko and Kefta. You see it took 44 days for it to show some response. In this patient, we had to do a partial capsulectomy and tectomy. And this patient underwent a total removal of the bag as well as the IUL. So we will just skip this video, just which shows the removal of the IUL and remove all this capsular bag and do a radical kind of vitrectomy. Vitrectomy after injections is becoming very, very common uh, because more usage, Avastin or Ozurex or whatever. So this requires a, also a radical kind of vitrectomy. If the cornea is bad, then you have to take the help of a cornea colleague. In this patient, temporary cater process was done and then put a button back. So last is how to tackle because this unfortunate situation which has happened can happen to anybody. So best is one person only talks to the uh, uh, you know parent in this uh, media, and but if you want to save from the court case and all, if you document all the findings, you are always on this safer side. It's very difficult to you know break this bad news. Always, always have a empath empathetic attitude towards the patient. And newer antibodies are coming up, which can be used in uh, uh, resistant cases. So thus, key words are always be on the guard. Suspect, react, and act very fast if you want good results, either by injections or by vitrectomy or sometimes re vitrectomy. This can yield good results in a lot of these unfortunate eyes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Lali. That was a wonderful presentation, as always. Any questions, uh, Srinivas, before we go on to uh, part? Anything different do you do in case of P acne and of What is that? P acne? P acne end of thalmitis post cataract surgery. Yeah. Anything different do you do from the routine cataract surgery? Like in case you if there are deposits on the posterior capsule, do you do a PPC along with that? And how often you have to remove the lens with the bag in these cases? Yes, yeah, sir. Removal of a bag is removal of the IUL and the bag is required in around say 20% or so. But by and large, once you do vitrectomy, I remove the entire PPC and irrigate antibiotics uh, from uh, behind and irrigate in the entire bag. Because that is important. It's not important to inject antibody in the vitreous cavity, but it's important to inject vancomycin in the capsular bag. Thank Thanks. you very much. Thank you, sir. So I have a quick question, sir, since there are also so many surgeons here. Uh, 6 mm uh, cannulas, you're using 23 or uh, 25 gauge? So this video showed uh, 20 gauge, but uh, nowadays, if you have the, the 23 gauge cannula, but inject straight rather than. Uh, uh, Dr. Chaitra, I don't know if I get 25 gauge, but 23 gauge is most commonly available. No, that's the Alcon one, right? Yes, yes. Are you, you do you have any information? Not, any other six? Not that you have 25 gauge, but I have not used it. Where who has DOR? No, DOR. DOR. So you know if any other people uh, making uh, six mm cannulas because we have a acute uh, you know requirement, but so many times it's just not available. I think we'll go on to your uh, last speaker, Dr. Chaitra Jadev. We're really sh running short of time. How to approach a case of retinal vasculitis? Right, so, uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, it's uh, going to be difficult to do this in six minutes, but I'm going to try my best. A lot of it has already been covered uh, by Dr. Vishali, so I can skip a couple of sites. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Chitra, for making me a part of this. Uh, I have no financial disclosures. So normally, if I would see a patient like this who's walked into my clinic today with uh, such an angry looking uh, retina, an angry looking disc with a large uh, neovascularization, I will simply refer the case to my UVR department or to Dr. JB or Dr. Vishali or Dr. Sudarshan who are there in the audience and in the panel. But uh, everybody doesn't have the luxury. So one must know how to approach a case of retinal vasculitis. It is basically an inflammatory disease of the blood vessels and it could uh, be associated with primarily ocular conditions or also with inflammatory or infectious uh, diseases in other parts of the body, uh, systemic issues. 
So we have a major advantage that we can directly visualize the blood vessels. It's the only organ. So it gives us information at a very early stage. So many times the ophthalmologist would be the first person to even diagnose a systemic issue. So some of the important history that we need to take in these patients is their age because each uh, disease or each uh, spectrum manifests at a different age group, their gender, their race. Medical history, again, is very important because it gives us, uh, you know, clues to the underlying causes. What are the medications they're on? Of course, their visual acuity, the extent of the retinal disease and uh, results of their diagnostic evaluation is also very, very important. Uh, so patients most often present with blurring of vision, floaters. Floaters is really common. Blurring or loss of vision also. Flashes, metamorphopsia, scotomas are some of the common symptoms. Now, uh, what are the signs that we see in active uh, retinite, uh, retinal vasculitis? You see sheathing or cuffing of the blood vessels. You see cells. You can see macular edema. Again, uh, very uh, important signs of inflammation. You can see skip areas. So it does not necessarily mean that the entire blood vessel could be involved. You'll also see occlusive retinal vasculitis. You can have hemorrhages, cotton wool spots, again, edema. Uh, Sclerosed vessels are seen, uh, you know, uh, later in the course, you can see a pale disc here. Late changes, uh, you can also see telangiectasia and neovascularization. So this is the entire spectrum of uh, vasculitis, infectious, neurological, systemic, and others as well. And each one of them, again, have their own different, uh, you know, subdivisions. Uh, uh, difficult to go into the details. But some of the systemic associations that we must be aware of is uh, these conditions like SLE, vagina, sarcoidosis, pars planitis. You know, we need to investigate them, uh, basically, to come to a diagnosis so that we can treat the underlying pathology. So fluorescent angiography in retinal vasculitis is really helpful. Now coming into the uh, more ophthalmic investigations point of view, it's sensitive in estimating the extent of the vasculitis and also the associated complications such as neovascularization and non-perfusion. Uh, we see leakage of the dye due to break in the inner uh, blood retinal barrier and also staining of the blood vessel wall. One uh, must know that the uh, FA may appear definitely more extensive than what we see clinically, so we get a good uh, estimation of the disease uh, severity. It also shows us the non-perfusion, as I said, late staining of arteries and veins can be seen, vascular occlusion, neovascularization, aneurysmal dilatations, and uh, cystoid macular edema as well. So these are some of the angiography pictures, as you can see the non-perfusion and you can see the neovascularization at the junction of the perfused versus non-perfused. You see disc staining, vascular leakage, staining. Uh, here again, neovascularization of the disc and extensive uh, non-perfusion, as you can see in the periphery. It also helps us in planning treatment when you want to do targeted uh, you know, laser for these patients, because many of them are young. You don't want to do extensive PRP at the same time. You want to treat the entire extent of the pathology. Also, it helps us to decide whether it's predominantly affecting veins or arteries and that also gives us a clue as to the diagnosis. When you see vein involvement, you think more in terms of tuberculosis, sarcoid or MS. And when there's arthritis, you think more in terms of SLE, PAN and other systemic vascular diseases. So when you see tubercular diseases, these are some of uh, you know, the findings, healthy young adults. You see retinal periphlebitis with peripheral, uh, you know, retinal uh, capillary closure. Also, you see indirect uh, hypersensory to mycobacterial antigens, as you can see in some of these pictures here. Treatment remains ATT and systemic steroids. And uh, ARN also we see pretty commonly retinal arthritis is almost uh, always accompanying this disease. Predominantly peripheral arteries are also secondary to antigen antibody deposition. Uh, Toxo has been covered extensively by madam, so I will not go into it. Rickettsial, uh, you see macular papular rashes on the feet and on the hands. You see also whitish lesions here in this clinical picture, a close-up of the same. Uh, coming to MS, this is a chronic disease. Uh, you can see it in young females, 20 to 40 years of age. You see retinal periphlebitis and similar to demyelinative uh, plaques that are seen in the brain. Bessette's disease, multi-system uh, inflammation, it is, causes retinal perivasculitis, which is a constant feature. Again, you can see hemorrhagic uh, periphlebitis. The angiography in Bessette's disease shows the presence of uh, diffuse capillary leakage and evidence of inadequate therapeutic response also it could be. is useful in, uh, uh, you know, basically in occlusive vasculopathy to pick up all these changes. Sarcoidosis, again, chronic granulomatis. You see candle wax drippings and ocular manifestations may be actually one of the first signs of systemic disease. This is the angiography. Vision loss can be due to macular edema or ischemia or VH secondary to your vascularization. Irvan is another condition that we see bilateral peripheral vascular occlusion associated with neuroretinitis. Treatment is against systemic steroids and PRP. 
Now, uh, last I want to mention that retinal vasculitis in a neonate can also be seen. This was a premature Asian uh, Indian male infant that we saw third visit of ROP. We started seeing some lesions. Uh, systemic sepsis screening was negative, but eight days later, an abdominal ultrasound showed a renal abscess with candida showing there, fluconazole. Follow up six weeks, there was good response. So we do, do need to investigate these patients. One uh, slide, my last slide. Okay. So this is one uh, from a paper by Anirudh where he has listed out, you know, all the different uh, investigations that may be uh, required based on our history and findings. To conclude, we, we need to confirm retinal vasculitis, rule out infective etiology, investigate to find out systemic disease association, a multidisciplinary approach is required. Steroids remain the mainstay and regular follow-up, even after complete resolution for any recurrence is very important. Thank you so much. Wonderful talk, Chaitra. You covered it all. Dr. Avinash, I'll ask that last question. What is this idiopathic recurrent branch retinal artery occlusion? Idiopathic retinal branch retinal artery occlusion? Or... Yeah. So, so you're talking about Irvine? So that's condition where you will have, uh, you know, it's a very rare entity where there's an optic disc inflammation and you will have this vasculitis, preferably at the branching, which will be there. So, and associated capillary non profusions can also be there. So again, the treatment is going to be somewhat similar in terms of steroids. And if there's new vascularization, which happens, then laser photocoagulation needs to be done. So we'll have an additional component of an uh, optic neuritis as well. Srinivas, one last Can question. Can I make a comment? Yes, yes. Yes, Dr. Bishwas. So that uh, retinal vasculitis can have a very extensive involvement, like frosted branch angitis, which is quite common in HIV-positive patients with CMB retinitis. But they can rarely be seen in case of TB and other causes also. Like Toxo also can present as the frosted branch angitis sometimes. So we should be not frightened up by that uh, extensive retinal vasculitis. And that investigations is often always a tailored and focused investigations. Is not really a battery of investigations should not be done. with a short differential diagnosis and then order the case. Just one additional point about, about chiralis vasculitis. So chiralis vasculitis uh, uh, seems to exist even after the resolution of infectious retinitis. So that should never be an indication to continue an antimicrobial therapy. Sometimes it takes even couple of months for the chiralis vasculitis to resolve. Thank you. So thank you one and all of you, our dear expert panel, eminent speakers and attendees watching us. Our thanks to AIS and the audiovisual team also for a very smooth conduct of webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Chaitra. Thank you, Dr. Vaishali, Dr. Thank Vaishali. you, thank you, thank you Dr. Thank Bishwas. You. Thank you, ma'am. Thank, thank you, Dr. Rajnarayan. Thank you, Dr. Lalit. Thank, Thank you. you.